Let's, we'll now turn to God's holy word and we'll read together uh, from Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, if you have a Bible that's from the church here, you will find out on page five, uh, 942, page 942. You'll find it right after the Paul's uh, two letters to the Corinthians. <clears throat> we'll read together the, the first ten verses. These will also be our texts for this morning, so this will be the basis on which our message will also be based. We're again reading at verse 1. They read God's word as follows. Paul, an apostle, and sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, uh, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are uh, throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, and so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than that, uh, other than what you receive or what you accept it, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human, of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So far, a reading from God's holy word. Brothers, sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, our text are the words we read this morning from Galatians and chapter 1. This is the beginning of a series of sermons I hope to, Lord willing, to do from Paul's letter. These are, this is a letter that Paul sent uh, to the, the churches in Galatia. Galatia was a Roman province situated in the middle of what today would be Turkey. Paul had preached the gospel to cities in this province during his first missionary trip. And so Paul knew many of these people to whom he is writing because he had been there. And many of them had come to the Christian faith and accepted Christ Jesus as their Lord. The believers of these churches who are mostly of Gentile background, Many other places, there would have been many Jews. There would have been some Jews here in these churches, but mostly they were, they were Gentiles. They were Greek people who were new to the Christian faith. It's also generally accepted that this letter of, that Paul writes to the Galatians is the first letter that we have that was written by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament Scriptures. <clears throat> As we look at this letter, you'll notice that there is great urgency for Paul to write this letter because he's heard that there are false preachers and teachers who are causing confusion among the believers in these churches. They're questioning Paul's teaching, and they're telling the people that Paul is he's not bringing to you the whole gospel because he's only teaching to you about the Lord Jesus, but he's forgetting that you must also do good works in order to be saved. We know later on from this um, letter that these teachers are, are Jews who have come, we often refer to them as the Judaizers, and they are teaching the people, in order that you might be saved, you don't only need the Lord Jesus, but you also, in addition, you need to keep the Jewish laws, and especially you need to be circumcised. 
And so what they are doing when they're talking to these people in these newly established churches, they're undermining Paul's authority. And they're claiming that, that Paul was only appointed by human beings, by, human, by people. And therefore, his ministry is, is not really a legitimate ministry. That's the reason why then Paul also writes here with a sense, a sense of urgency. Because he, he sees how the freedom Christ has given to these new believers is being undermined uh, by these false teachers. The false teachers said, you know, Jesus isn't enough. You also need to be circumcised in order to be saved. But Paul, uh, you know, Paul, he proclaims that your salvation is only and completely the work of Jesus Christ. But don't believe Paul. But yeah, that's the very thing that Paul was writing or was teaching them. Paul is teaching them, he said, in Christ you are completely free. And if you add anything to the Lord Jesus, you are putting yourself in bondage. You are becoming a slave to the law. Now, we need to understand very clearly, and that's going to come out later on in this letter as well, that, that Paul is not saying the law doesn't matter. He's not saying that we are free from the law and we don't need to live according to God's law. But what he's saying is, he says, the law is not able to save you. And so keeping the law is not going to work anything, not going to add anything to your salvation. Because only the Lord Jesus is able to save you. And he saves you completely, entirely. And so Paul is talking about freedom in this letter. Word that you've often comes back over and over again throughout the letter. Well, you know, freedom has become an important word in our society today. Recently, we had the Freedom Convoy in Ottawa today. Understand that there's a, another motorcycle convoy with the same idea of promoting freedom in this country. People on every side of the political spectrum are speaking today about freedom. But the reality is this. The reality is that, is that there is no such thing as freedom in this world. People are all enslaved in their own reality because they cling to the things they believe will give them peace and the things they think will give them security. But such things is never able to give anyone the freedom they crave. You see, from a, a human perspective, we need to ask, what does freedom mean? What do people mean when they talk about freedom? Well, many would say freedom means to be free from sickness, to be free from disease. Or others may say freedom means to be free uh, from the government and government intervention. And so people want to be free to be able to make their own choices and to be able to do what they desire. There are many who think about freedom as having a government that takes care of every need of its citizens. And so we are freedom means to submit to the government because the government will give you everything that you need in your life. You think of Karl Marx, whose ideas are really prevalent in our society today. Karl Marx claimed that freedom for the worker is to be free from capitalism. On the other hand, you have the capitalists who claim that people are free when they're able to use their money in order to improve their own, own lives. And so we need to be in control of our own destiny. That's what they would say is true freedom. Well, beloved, without getting into the merits of all these different human systems, what Scripture reveals is that none of these things are able to give us the freedom that man really needs and is seeking. Marxism leads to the tyranny of the people by the people. Capitalism leads to the enslavement of people to the material things of this life. But the freedom that is true freedom is that which is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? The, the grace of God, His gift to us in the Lord Jesus Christ is that He comes to set us free from the tyranny of sin and evil. Every single human system today is enslaved to the material things of this world in one way or another. Christ comes, beloved, so that He might free us uh, from the evil of this world. 
and that he might give to us the glorious hope of eternal life there in the kingdom of our God. So to be in Christ and to belong uh, to the kingdom of God, that, beloved, that is truly liberating. For it is only in Christ uh, that we now are able to live in this glorious hope of the life everlasting. And therefore, as God's people, we don't want to cling uh, to uh, the things of this world. We want to cling to our Lord Jesus Christ. We cling to Him as our Savior who gives to us the freedom that we need. And that, beloved, that is the very heart of the gospel. It's the heart of the message that Paul is going to drive home here in the letter to the Galatians. And so this morning we will listen to God's word under this theme. The theme is living freely in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So living freely in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And under that theme we'll look at two things. First of all, we'll look at the freedom that we have in the, uh, in, in, in the grace of Christ. And secondly, that we hold on to our freedom in Christ. At the very beginning of this letter, uh, Paul is, is laying the groundwork uh, for his message that he's going to elaborate on later on in this particular letter. So he's writing to uh, believers who have come to believe in the Lord Jesus and look to him as their Lord and as their Savior. They look to Jesus, the one who sets them free from the curse of sin. Jesus, the one who gives them the hope of eternal life with the Lord God. But what's happened since Paul has left them is they are now in danger, giving up that freedom and becoming enslaved to the law. That is the law of God. We'll see later in this letter that Paul does not say uh, and does not teach the people that the law is not important. But he, what he says is he says the law cannot save you. Only the Lord Jesus is able to save you. And so the law shows us that we are slaves to sin. But Jesus Christ comes and he delivers us from that sin. And so as, as Paul now addresses the, this issue with the, the believers there, Paul first of all needs to make clear uh, that the gospel message, uh, uh, where that gospel message is, gonna, is coming from. Because what's the first thing? that people do when they do not like the message that someone brings. You think also in, in our political atmosphere, uh, when, uh, what do people do when they try to uh, oppose uh, their opponent? They attack the messenger. Right? You attack the messenger because you want to discredit his message. And that's what these false teachers are also doing. They said to, to these believers, he said, you know, Paul, Paul doesn't have the authority uh, to, to teach you. You shouldn't listen to him because he's not really an apostle. He's not really an authority on the gospel. And that's why the very first words that Paul writes here in this gospel and in this letter is that he proclaims himself, or that he proclaims himself uh, to be an apostle. You see, the office of an apostle is, is only found in the, in, the new, in the early church. The office was limited to the 12 disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, we know Judas left and then Matthias was repla replaced Judas. And the only other one that, is, that the Scriptures reveal as an apostle is Paul. And we know that after these men who were apostles died, the church never again spoke about apostles. Paul says in verse 1 that he is an apostle sent not from men, nor by a man, but by who? By the Jesus Christ and God the Father who has raised him from the dead. Now, you know, normally when, when Paul uh, would write his letters uh, the, uh, that, he, that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's what he would say. Uh, but he, that's about all he would say, right? He's simply say, Paul, an apostle, Lord Jesus Christ, and then he goes on with his message. But here, notice how he goes into more detail. He says, Paul, an apostle, who has been sent, not by, from men, nor by a man. And the reason that he elaborates on this is because these false teachers are, are saying, no, Paul is not a real apostle. His message is a message that comes from other people, from other men. In other words, Paul's message is a message that comes from a human source, not from God. 
And they also argue that, that Paul was made an apostle by, by men, not by God. Now, apostles were, of course, always uh, appointed by, by God. And they said, well, no, Paul was not appointed by God. But he, has, he was appointed by human beings. And so, therefore, don't listen to what Paul has to say because he doesn't come with God's word, but he comes with human words. Now, this point is important for us today uh, as believers, but also I mean, you may be new to the Christian faith. Perhaps you're just coming to the Christian faith and you're just learning more about it. And then the question would be, so, so why? Why would we listen to Paul? What gives Paul's message credibility for us also today? Well, in the very first letter that, that Paul writes, at least that we have record of, he says, I did not get, Paul says, I did not get the, my message from human beings. It didn't come from fellow man. Neither was I appointed by a human being. No, I was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, and I was sent by God the Father. In other words, he says, my message has a divine source. I received it from the Lord Jesus Christ and from his Father. And it is Christ and, and his Father who have also appointed me to be an apostle. And so the apostles or the believers in Galatia, uh, they, they need to know that Paul is indeed speaking with authority from heaven, from God. And notice how powerful his words are. He says, my message comes not from men, but from Jesus Christ. And then you might say, but the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus is not a man. And yes, indeed, the Lord Jesus came to this world in our flesh and blood, took upon himself human form, but he's not only a man, but Scripture also attests that he is also God. Right? Jesus is the very Son of God who is sent by the Father, and he is the source of the message I'm bringing you, Paul says. Right? An attack on the Apostle Paul is also an attack on the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. So by attacking Paul, what are these people doing? These false teachers are also attacking the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has sent Paul to them. And then after he establishes his credentials as a bona fide apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, appointed not by men, but appointed by Christ. And of course, we know that from the book of Acts that happened on his conversion on the way to Damascus when the Lord Jesus himself appeared to him in a great light. And after he's now set out his credentials, Paul now addresses the believers with the benediction that we hear every Sunday morning. In verse 3, saying, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, the gospel message can be summed up in two words. Grace and peace. First word, grace. Grace speaks about God's gift of salvation. Right? Grace simply means God's gift. Now, you know, when, when anybody gives you a, a gift, you, you don't receive a gift because somehow you have earned that gift. No, it's somebody gives it to you because uh, they're kind to you. They, they want to be kind to you. When you receive that gift, you, you don't reject the gift, even though you might not always necessarily like it, but you don't reject it, but you receive it with appreciation. And so Paul reminds the Galatians uh, that, about the gift that, that he gave them when he preached to them the gospel. But Paul also makes it, it was my gift. No, the gift that I gave to you is the gift that the Lord Jesus Christ gives to his people. It is the gift of salvation. He says, this is the gift from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father in heaven, he sent his Son, Jesus Christ, into the world as a great gift to mankind. And the Lord Jesus, in his way, he also gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us, Paul says, from the present evil age. Notice that word, he rescues us. That's an important theme you'll find throughout the entire Scriptures. All the Scriptures, you can say, reveals to us that God is on a rescue mission. Right? It starts in Genesis chapter 3. After, man, after Adam and Eve, they fell into sin. Then God comes to Eve, and then God promises Eve, Eve, I will give you a seed. I will give you a son who will come and who will rescue you from your sins. 
Or we can very quickly skip over to the people of Israel when they were in Egypt and in slavery to Egypt. The Lord God came and, and he rescued his people Israel from the Egyptians and where they were in an impossible situation. There's no way Israel could have delivered themselves. So God comes and he rescues them. And what does he do? He goes and he gives to them the promised land of Canaan. And so God is already revealing to his people in the Old Testament that he is on a rescue mission for his people. And the one that he's going to send to rescue us, the one he's going to send to save us, is his son, Jesus Christ. Now the question is, so what is the Lord Jesus Christ? What does he rescue us from? And Paul says he rescues us from the present evil age. Well, this age in which we're living is what he's talking about. In this age, all mankind, Paul says, we're all in bondage to sin. Right? The present evil age lives in rebellion against the Lord God in heaven. And how do we know that this present age and also the people of this world, how they live in rebellion against God? Well, we know that, beloved, because it is the world who crucified the Son of God on the cross. The very one that God sent to save and rescue the world. By that crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, what did the people of the world show? It showed that the world people did not want to be rescued. No, people love to live in their slavery to sin and to evil. And so when Christ called his people to repent when he was here on this earth. When God called his people Israel uh, to look for, and to seek for their salvation in him as their Savior, what did they do? They rejected the Savior who was sent from heaven. That's why, even though our society speaks about freedom, beloved people today continue to live in bondage to sin and to evil. What people think is, is freedom is actually slavery to sin and to misery. If you think that your material things, your money, and your possessions gives you freedom, then you don't see how those material things are really enslaving you. Because your money, because your, money your possessions, they can never give you life. <clears throat> if you think somehow that you are able to make this world in which you are living, that you can make this age in which we are a better place, the reality is that you will never create a world that is truly free. Beloved, there will always be evil in this world. There always has been, always will be suffering. There will be disappointments. There will be betrayals. And ultimately, every single person in the whole world will have to face death at one point in their lives. The biggest lie that is being taught today that somehow you can be free in this world and you can find freedom here in this age. God's gift, beloved, is that he will rescue us from this miserable world. And he comes and delivers us from the futility and the uselessness of this life. So how? How is he going to rescue us from, the, uh, from this evil age? Well, beloved, it's already done. Rescue has already taken place. The Lord Jesus came and, and he did that when he gave himself on the cross for our sins. Right there on the cross, he paid for our sins so that we, are no longer, so that we no longer live today under the wrath and under the curse of Almighty God. All oh, these people of this present age, they cling to the sinful desires of the heart. But the Lord Jesus comes and he delivers us from those sinful desires. Right? The result of being forgiven is that we no longer look to the present age for our joy and for our peace. If you know that you have been forgiven your sins and you know that you're not going to find joy and peace here on this earth. The present age, you know, is going to pass away. But in Christ, we also know that we now look forward to a new age. A new age uh, when all evil will be wiped away from the earth. When all our suffering, all our pain 
will be gone. When we'll be able to live forever in the glorious presence of the Lord our God. There is, beloved, no greater gift than the eternal life that's given to you by your Lord. And it's that grace of God that leads us to the second part of the, of the benediction or the greeting, the word peace. Right with God's grace, there comes peace in our lives. And peace speaks about the freedom that we have in the Lord Jesus. God's grace always leads to a sense of well-being in our lives. When we understand the grace of God, when we understand also the gift and we receive that gift of Christ in faith, that means I now begin to know that it is well with my soul and that it's well with my life. Peace, beloved, means that I no longer need to be restless in this evil world. I don't need to pursue the pleasures of this life because God has given to me something better and more glorious. If my sins are truly forgiven through the blood of Christ, that means my life is safe. My life is secure in the arms of my Savior. And not only that, but now... Now I begin to look forward to the end of this evil age. Now look forward to the coming of the new age. In Christ, I am free. Free to live for my Lord. In Christ, I am no longer in bondage to the sinful desires of my heart. But I now long, I long with my whole being for my Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with Paul, we may then also declare to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then in verse 6, Paul comes to the reason why he is writing this letter to the churches in Galatia. He speaks some pretty harsh words after you know, a pretty nice introduction. He, now he speaks some harsh words for the believers. He says, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you uh, to, to live in the grace of Christ and that you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Again, the key word here, beloved, is the word grace. God has offered his, these people and he's offered us his grace which means that he came and he offered them the gift of salvation. But now, Paul says, very quickly, you have perverted that offer from God into something that is offensive to God. I'm astonished, absolutely astonished, that you so quickly have deserted the one who called you. Now, there are some interpretation questions we need to think through here in verse 6. Who is Paul talking about when he talks about the one who called you? There's two interpretations that are possible. Is, is Paul talking about himself as the one who called them when he first came and he preached the gospel to them on that missionary journey? Or is Paul talking here about the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who has called them? Is Paul saying that they have deserted him, Paul? Or is Paul saying that they have deserted the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, the next part of the sentence, you notice, speaks about the grace of Christ. The grace of Christ. I mean, all, most translations uh, have that. But we need to understand that there are many Greek, old Greek documents of this, of this passage that do not have the word Christ here. Just grace. If you follow those old Greek documents, then the sentence begins to make more sense if you take the word Christ out. It then says that these believers have quickly deserted the one who called them, which would be Jesus, to live in his, that is Jesus' grace. But the way it is right now, it is, it's, Paul is saying, you have deserted the one who has called you to live in the grace of Christ. Then that would be reference back to Paul. But I believe it's much stronger here, and it makes much more sense if it is indeed Paul, it is Jesus Christ whom they are deserting, the one who has shown to them his grace. You see, Paul's concern is not that they have deserted him, Paul. Paul's just a servant. 
But his concern is that they have deserted the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to them. Just imagine that. Jesus, through the Apostle Paul, has called them to, to live in his grace, to accept his precious gift of salvation. And what have they done? They have deserted the Lord Jesus by perverting that very gospel, that very message. No wonder Paul is astonished. He says, what happened to you? Jesus has given to, to you freedom. He delivered you from your slavery to sin. He's given to you a new, a glorious hope. And now you turn away from that very freedom that the Lord Jesus has given to you. And you're making yourselves slaves to sin again. How oh, foolish. How can you be so foolish to turn away from the freedom of Christ? Well, you know, you can be sure that these believers in Galatia didn't do this on purpose. They didn't think and somehow in their own minds, they, were in the, they didn't think at all that they had deserted the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul says, yes, you have. You have turned the message of God's grace into a different gospel, which is no gospel at all, which is no good news at all. And beloved, as, as you reflect on what Paul writes, you see, this message is as relevant today as it was back in the days of Paul there to the churches in Galatia. When you go look at the history of the church, you'll notice that Christians throughout the ages have very quickly turned the message of grace to a message of bondage to the law. So our question right now, first of all, is, so what happened to these churches here in Galatia? Uh, this happened. Well, we discover what happened in verse 7 where Paul says, some people are throwing you into confusion and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, we're going to learn more about these people who are bringing these people into confusion later on in this letter, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. We'll look at that more in the future. But what Paul says this, he says, there were people who came to these churches. These are Jewish believers and very likely that they, they came from Jerusalem and heard that Paul had established churches in that area. And, and they didn't like what Paul was, was teaching. And so they were opposing the work of Paul among these believers. And, and they were saying to the believers in Galatia, Paul, yes, well, of course Paul is a good man. He came and he taught you about the Lord Jesus and that was a good thing. But Paul didn't tell you, he didn't teach you the full, the complete gospel. All Paul told you was that you needed to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Lord Jesus Christ is the complete source of your salvation and you don't need anything else but the Lord Jesus. But they said to the people, but you know what, uh, well, Paul has good intentions, but you need to understand that to be saved, you need more than that. You need more than Jesus. You also need to be circumcised. You also need to follow the Jewish customs uh, of the law that was practiced in the Old Testament. And so really what they're doing is they're bringing a message, we could say, of Jesus Christ plus. Right? Jesus Christ plus some human activity in order that we might be saved. And so we can think in terms of to be saved, you need Jesus and you need the law. You need to keep the law. If you don't keep the law, then you're not going to be saved. You need Jesus and you need good works because all good works you can't be saved. So your good works add to the work of the Lord Jesus. You need Jesus and you need to speak it in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, then you can't be saved. You need Jesus and you need baptism. As if somehow baptism is necessary for our salvation. Not to say that baptism isn't important, but baptism doesn't save. Or you need Jesus and, and you need to follow the customs and the traditions of the church to be saved. It doesn't mean that traditions of the church cannot be good traditions and customs, but they're not a means of somehow adding to the work of the Lord Jesus. That saves us. And when we think about that, beloved, I think we can, we can begin to understand where these people are indeed, where they're coming from. Right? Don't we have the same struggles in our own lives? How difficult isn't it for us to, uh, to ex uh, as human beings, to accept a gift from God, a free gift? 
Right? There's always that impulse in us that we want to add something to our salvation. A gift is just too good to be true. There must be, there must be something that, that we must also do for our salvation. Right? It can't be true, can it? That I'm saved by Christ alone? Does that make sense? There must be something that I also need to do. Perhaps it's not what I need to do. Perhaps I need to have some sign from God that, that indeed that, that gift is really intended for me. Well, you know, beloved, Paul understood this way of reasoning. Why? Because Paul himself struggled with it. Paul had to deal with this kind of reasoning in his own life. Remember, in his, own, in his early life, Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, meaning he was the strictest kind of Pharisee who kept every single law, right? He followed rule upon rule and law upon law, thinking that somehow by doing that, he was able to please God. God would be so happy with him because he was such a good and uprighteous man, kept, the low, kept all the rules and all the laws of God. In fact, Paul says, I was so zealous that I even persecuted the church of God, the church of Christ, because I thought that was doing God's will. But something happened. And you may remember what happened in the life of Paul. Christ came into Paul's life. And Christ called Paul on the way to Damascus when he confronted Paul was in the great light. And that confrontation with the Lord Jesus Christ radically changed the very life of the Apostle Paul. It changed Paul's understanding about the very way of salvation. When he suddenly came to, to face to face with the Lord Jesus, then he began to understand by faith that the law that he was following was only a, enslaving his life, that it was not the way to freedom. Understood in a way that perhaps we even continue to have troubles to understand, that the law could never save him. Nor that law was only convicting him of his own sins and that he was worthy of God's wrath. The law, Paul understood, was never intended to save us. Beloved, the law of God always drives us to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. For, for then we realize only Christ has the power to save us from our sins. And only Christ can rescue us from the present evil age. Christ did so by giving himself his life for us on the cross for our sins. Beloved, Paul now began to understand that salvation is 100% the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There may, that means you cannot add a single thing, not even an iota, to your salvation. There's nothing that you and I can do, no rules that we can keep, no laws that, that we should follow, no customs that can add anything to what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Now let me repeat. Paul does not say that you don't need to keep the law of God. He doesn't say suddenly we are free from God's law. But what he says is this. He says the law will never make you free. The law will always keep you under the curse and under the wrath of God because it convicts you of your own sin. It is only Christ who can free you from your sins. Only Christ who can deliver you from the very wrath of God. And beloved, if anyone says anything differently, they have perverted, Paul says, the gospel. These false teachers who have confused these new Christians, oh, that they came with good intentions, but what they've done is they've poisoned the well. You know that water in a well may be good water, wonderful water to drink, but when anybody comes and he drops even a drop of poison into the water, then the water is no longer safe. And so also when, when we add the idea of good works or that certain traditions or customs are needed in order that we might be saved, the gospel, beloved, has been contaminated. Then you have compromised the very honor that belongs to the Lord Jesus and to Jesus alone. 
For then we want to take credit for even a part, even a small part of our salvation. But no, it is by grace and by grace alone. It is Christ's gift to us. And it is his work alone that we, beloved, are saved. So Paul warns these new believers. Even if we, and you know, he includes himself in that we and, and his fellow workers. Even if, if we or an angel from heaven should come and should preach a gospel different from the one that, that we preach to you. And the gospel we preach to you is a message that came from Christ alone. Let them be under God's curse. Let them be anathema. You see, the spiritual danger is so great that Paul needs to even repeat the warning in the next verse when he says, and I say it again, I say it again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, that is the one that I preached to you, let them be under God's curse. Let them be anathema. Let them be cursed. You know, today, we don't like to speak so strongly. We like to be polite and not offend people. Right? Universities have these safe places where people can go if you're triggered because of something somebody said. But Paul, Paul speaks in the strongest terms. Why? Because he understands how serious this threat is to the believers. Paul understands that the very life of these people whom he loves is now at stake. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that preachers have a license to speak and to preach in harsh ways. The gospel needs to be preached in a tactful way, in a loving way. The gospel needs to also encourage the listener to, to turn to Christ. But beloved, when, when the very gospel message is being undermined, and also the preacher needs to forcefully counteract it. Why? Because the very souls of God's people are then at stake. Now what is Paul's purpose in writing this letter? Well, he comes out in verse 10. If you read verse 10, he says, uh, Paul says it, uh, that he is trying to, uh, he, says, he asks the question, he says, am I trying to, to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to, believe, to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's what Paul says. He says, my purpose in writing to you is not to please you, it's not to please other people, but it is my desire to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Beloved, the only way that a preacher can help his congregation is to be a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that he will only preach Christ Jesus and him crucified. He will preach salvation is possible only through the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because, beloved, Christ has given you the gift of life. Yes, he offered you that gift when he gave his life for you on the cross. Therefore, do not let go of the very freedom that he's given to you by following false teachings of those who, who think somehow that you also need to do something to be saved. No, oh, Christ has freed you through his precious gift when he gave his life for you on the cross. Therefore, cling to that gift with your whole being, with your whole heart, with your whole life. Remember, beloved, we don't set ourselves free. We don't rescue ourselves from this evil age. Christ came and he has rescued you. And so Christ alone, he sets you and he sets me free. Amen.